Hello and welcome back to the Reapers. So we recently did a video, a whole series of videos actually, on fighter aircraft of the world. We went through about 200 fighter aircraft and it wasn't particularly serious, it was just enthusiasts talking about aeroplanes that they love with a few facts and figures put in there. And it was really good and the, the viewers loved it and we liked doing it. We all learned a lot basically. So we thought, okay, let's start doing other planes. We've got bombers, we've got attack aircraft, we've got reconnaissance, spy planes, all kinds of stuff. We can pretty much go on forever because there are so many planes. Today we're going to start on bombers. Um, I don't think we're going to get through them all, but let's try and get about 25 to 50% done if we can today. Um, one thing to note, uh, so uh, in fact, let's credit the guy that's done this. So the guy that's doing this, as we can see in this version up here, is compiled by A13X. Whoever A13X is is legend, and we owe you a beer, because uh, he's the guy who's putting together all of these um, you know, amazing quality uh, 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 J JPEGs or, or whatever it is. Uh, now, an improvement over last time. Last time we had a, a, a kind of like a high res photo, but we couldn't zoom in for the fighters. It was very frustrating. That was my fault. I was using the wrong source. Uh, YouTube viewers have pointed me in the right direction, and I've now got a source where I can zoom in and we can literally look at the fine details like this, which is awesome. Uh, so we're going to uh, uh, we'll redo the fighters at some point just to have a look at the cool pictures. Uh, but today is bombers. So uh, on with bombers. Now bombers aren't my particular bag. The reason is the majority of bombers over history have uh, killed many more civilians than they ever have combatants and that is an issue for cap um hence i don't really go for bombers however that's not saying that they are not remarkable pieces of engineering and machinery and history because they are um so uh, let's before we get started i should say that this is just a smidgen of the amount of real bombers um that have been throughout the world there, there's probably hundreds of types of bombers um, but obviously A13X is not going to put hundreds of bombers in. I'm just glad he picked out, you know, the big ones through history that we've got here. Um, and they're all, uh, they're in order of name. So Avro, Star First, then BAC, Boeing and Convair. And they're to scale as well, or, you know, to within in a few pixels, they are drawn to scale. And that gives us um, a great size, uh, a great uh, way of uh, uh, comparing them, which we like to do. We like to compare the basic figures, the size, the weight, the speed, the stuff like that. Um, okay. Uh, just how it's going to work today, use the, or use the usual routine, we'll start with a bomber, Cap will say his little spiel to begin with, then you guys will say your bits, there's no need to talk over each other or to compete, you'll all be in plenty of time, so just uh, save your bit until, you know, if you're, you, you've got your time. Okay, any questions before we kick off? <clears throat> Rister Horton, Rister Horton 9. Whee! What's a Horton 9? <laughs> It's basically something that looks like uh, a B2 that the Germans built in World War II and was suddenly put apart. It's a Stahl plane. It's, it's a Stahl plane. <laughs> it's a weird plane. Okay, so... Uh, oh, it's a Lincoln 1. I thought it was a Lancaster. I thought this was a Lancaster, but it's a Lincoln. Does anyone know the difference here? I didn't know the Lincoln was even a thing. Is it a Lancaster? Lincoln a bit later and a little bit bigger. Could be wrong there. It was developed from the Lancaster. Oh, okay. So yes, yeah, so the, the first, the Lincoln One and Two were the Lancaster Four and Five. Basically, what is that plane, guys? When was it? Was the Lincoln after the World World, world War Two then? Uh, its first flight was 9th of June, nineteen forty-four. So three days after D-Day. Right. So it is. So it was used. I, I wasn't aware it was a thing, but so this was part of history then. Okay. Well, we'll go with it. Um, so. The only brief things I know is it used the same engines from the Spit, so with the Merlin and later on probably the Griffins, um, which were V12s, four of them. Um, I've got, uh, they were at Riot this year. I've got a video of one taking off. It's an amazing sight. Whopping great bird, a bit like the uh, kind of B17 of the, uh, that the Americans had with guns you know peppered in, in gun turrets all over the place including a rear one top one doesn't have a ball turret at the bottom um we've got some figures about it guys um uh service history weight of so Halo. um its first flight as i said 9th of june 1944 it was introduced into active service in 1945 it never actually saw active service because it was going to uh, be sent to the pacific to fight in japan but oh. the war ended before it could be used uh, it then flew with the Royal Air Force until 1963 and with the Argentine Air Force until 1967 and when it was retired and replaced by jet bombers. It's a long time, isn't it? Bear oh, the sweet irony. Bearing how, my, how, how much um, jet had changed that, I'm amazed, I'm amazed it was still going, but I guess it was used as um, later on as a uh, reconnaissance or anti-submarine or something like that, I imagine. Um, but we got a payload for it. 
Uh, up to 14,000 pounds. 14,000 pounds. So, so let's start remembering these payloads as we go, because obviously payloads are going to increase. Uh, I mean, if you want to talk about the Lancaster in general, there was a special version of the Lancaster which could mount a single 22,000 pound bomb as well. Ah. Yes, it does. It was the 22 pound DP bomb. So the Grand Was that the one they cut the belly out of? So yeah. It, the yeah, bomb basically. Yeah. They actually developed the bomb because they tried to um, to destroy a certain viaduct, which was just impossible to hit with Second World War bomber accuracy. There's actually pictures of it. it. It looks like a freaking moon landscape or something. There's bomb craters everywhere, and that stupid viaduct is just still standing. So they basically made huge bombs that would burrow into the ground and explode underground and basically make an earthquake, which then actually ended up collapsing the viaduct in the end. Did it work? It did. Yay. So, and, and we also dropped these nearing the end of the war. I remember um, the Nazis also had... Um, massive concrete domes that they started building because obviously um, the allies were bombing and so they started making massive impenetrable domes to hide uh, you know I don't know weapons caches or whatever I can't remember yeah, and you boats I think you mean you were pens yeah you were pens that was seven there's inland the stuff as well but yeah and normal bombs just couldn't get through this reinforced this steel reinforced concrete and so they also started dropping grand slams on those which could just crack the concrete open because it's a big old bomb didn't they also drop it on the turpids, actually, or something along those lines? Interesting. Um, I don't remember. Could, could, it, could have been a tall boy, one of the two, I think, it dropped yeah. on the turpids. I think it was tall boy, which is 12,000. This is purely just guessing at my head, or 12 or 15,000. And then the Grand Slam, which was the big daddy. Are those the biggest bombs ever made, apart from... Are they bigger than Moab? Mm, no, I don't think so. What's Moab? What's the size of Moab? Are we talking in terms of explosive force or in yeah, terms no, of uh, in terms of um, act? No, in terms of conventional warhead size, if you like, or conventional warhead weight. Um, uh, what's the warhead weight of that one? I have. I think we've heard twenty-two thousand pounds was the biggest grand slam. Which is bloody big. Uh, oh, the grand, twenty-two thousand pounds was the weight. The entire in total. weight. Oh, okay. I know just the filling weight, which is the warhead. And the uh, explosive charges is eight is eighteen thousand seven hundred pounds. What's the so uh, a quick a quick Google has told me that the Grand Slam had a blast yield equivalent to six and a half tons of TNT. Uh, the oh, the Moab is the biggest eleven tons. Oh, yeah, no. and the biggest non-nuclear bomb ever is a Russian bomb called the father of all of bombs, uh, the FOAB. Uh, which uh -huh. has a blast yield equivalent to 44 tons of TNT wow, well, out of a 15,000 pound bomb. How do you drop that? Carefully. Uh, <laughs> Carefully. <laughs> yes, it's, it's a 15,000 pound uh, thermobaric bomb. Wow. The same way America dropped the nukes. <laughs> okay, fine. Right, we've got a skew, as we always do. Uh, but generally, uh, the majority of these guys, uh, these Lancasters, uh, were... Uh, night fighters, bomber command. Uh, we drew the long straw um, in World War Two. The Allies, England, got to do the night bombing, where they were relatively inverted commas safe. Um, and we got we unfortunately bombed civilians mainly in towns, and we dropped uh, these things. Were dropping. Um, I can't remember what they're called incendiary bombs. Yeah, you were firebombing, Cap. Fire -bombing. Basically, what would become during Vietnam, carpet bombing. Roger. So they would drop high explosives to knock the tops off the of the uh, German houses, and then uh, and then the incendiaries, which set them alight. Very naughty. Um, and then the in the daytime, the B 17s and whatnot of the Americans who drew the short straw um, would uh, uh, come in and do the same thing in the day. And both sides obviously had to, sorry. Both um, bomber command and the Americans had huge huge losses. Obviously, um, they just send in waves of Lancasters and B 17s, etc and um, have massive losses due to flak and Messerschmitts, I suppose. But um, Okay, so we've got uh, the only figure I think we're missing there is a speed. I like to do all the speeds because it puts us roughly a place in history and I find it interesting. Do we have a maximum speed of this? I know it's going to be slow, but just a maximum speed of a Lancaster will be fine. And a range, a range. Maximum the bombers speed it would go 319 miles and its range was 2,930 miles. 200 and 2000 that's unloaded. More like yeah, 1,500 bombs on board. So 2,000 miles? Question mark. 
Where's that? Yeah. 1,500 with bombs uh, on board, 3,000 without, okay. roughly. Uh, let's say the pilot was being stingy with the fuel, probably like 16,000. That's still pretty far, though. I mean, it's still like further than an F-15 or something, so it's pretty... Well, yeah, I mean, those oh, have yeah, massive still... amounts of fuel, and they're designed to fly very high, usually, as well. Oh, Absolutely. If you're only yeah, going 200 miles an hour, it doesn't take nearly as much fuel as an mm -hmm. F-15 mm -hmm. during supersonic. Okay. Yeah, the, I'm pretty sure the American equivalent to the Lincoln was the Super Fortress. Yeah, they're around about the same time. Roger. Unfortunately, we don't have the Super Fortress. Oh, yes, we do. We do have it there. Okay, we'll carry on in a second. Yeah, Super Fortress is really by the way. Um, the Tall Boys and Grand Slams were used to in the mind of foundations of the V2 assembly bunker, actually. That was what I was talking about, yeah. And the Turbids was, in fact, sunk by uh, Tall Boys. Ah, how interesting. So they just decided to drop whopping great bombs on it in the end. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Um, just out of interest, um, what's that bulge at the bottom of the Lancaster, that bulge at the rear kind of dorsal area? Does anyone know what that is? Is it a fuel cell? Um, I know that you're going to... say possibly sure. the bomb site? No, the bottom, right at the bottom rear. A bomb site's going to be in the front, I think. Yeah, are usually do. There, there is a bomb site. It's in that glass uh, kind of cage at the front. It was a very, um, very. I can't remember the name of the bomb site we used. I think uh, the uh, Americans used the same. It's a really good bomb site invented in England, I think. Someone's going to correct me on that. Okay, guys, let's, let's move on. I mean, one thing that's bugging me a bit is they've missed a really important plane out. Um, it, well, I'd like to cover it very briefly. Um, so after the B-17, the B-25, the Lancaster, that, uh, the Pacific came and an aircraft came, uh, an American aircraft came to fill the Pacific role and I believe it was called the B-29. Yes, the Super Fortress. The B-29 Super Fortress and we've kind of missed that out. Um, do we have any details of, of that? I mean, it was obviously bigger than a Lancaster and a B-17. Its first flight was uh, 1942 and it was introduced on the 8th of May 1944. We do have a TU-4, though, by the way. That's close enough. <laughs> it's basically a Russian <laughs> copy of the Super Fortress. Oh, that's now, we're, t we're talking about the Super Fortress, the actual good one. Ha! <laughs> more drama. Yeah, more drama. The, the Super Fortress was one hell of a plane. It was huge. And, and it was... yeah, also was used to drop the yeah, only yeah, actual yes. combat nukes in history. So. That's what I was getting at. That's why, um, it, yeah, it, 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 it's... Uh, but, does anyone remember the name? Oh, God, what's the name of the bloody The Enola Gay. Enola Gay. Dropping the first one from a, uh, an atoll, I believe. Uh, in he named it after his mom. That seems kind of cynical in retrospect. Mm, a little bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. For, a, for a sense of scale on the Super Fortress, when we were talking about the Lancaster, they modified it so they could get a single Grand Slam inside by taking the belly out. Yeah. They also yeah. modified the Super Fortress so it could carry two Grand Slams uh -huh. at the same time. Well, we do have a B-50 Super Fortress below, which I'm assuming was a modified B-29, so... Uh, no, B-52 came during No, 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 B-50, B-50 Super Fortress. Uh, Cap, if you want to see basically a picture of a B-29, look in the third column, the third from the bottom, T-4 ball, that's just a Russian copy of the oh. uh, nine. Yeah, so the, yeah, the that looks the like B it, yeah. fifty. The B fifty was a post World War Two development of the B twenty nine. They put uh, better engines on it, reinforced the structure, the tail was made bigger, and they uh, made a few more, a few other improvements. Look how many. It uh, was introduced uh, nineteen forty eight. If we will go to the bull, uh, third row, third column at the bottom, uh, it's the closest thing we can find to the B twenty nine. Look how it's bristling machine guns. Two. Bull turrets at the top, two bull turrets at the bottom, side turrets, rear turrets. Like this is like back in the day, obviously before missiles, when it was guns, machine guns against machine guns. Yeah, but I believe really um, both the Super Fortress and the Flying Fortress, the U.S. said that the bombers would be able to fly the missions without the escorts because of how many guns they had on it. Well, that was the plan, because originally yeah, exactly. the fighters didn't have the range to provide escort yeah, until yeah. they developed the Mustang. Exactly right. So they needed the bombers to carry as many machine guns as they could. I look at the Super Fortress, it had 13 50 caliber machine guns. Wow. But also, I think in the Super Fortress, they actually had some guidance systems in there, which the P-17 didn't have to, so there should be a lot more deadly. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, um, I would not want to fly a fighter against one of these. Uh, <laughs> and a wall of lead coming in your direction. Oh, I'm not mistaken, uh, the Super uh, Fortress is the one where they started using automated turrets on them as well. Oh, really? Yes, and indeed. also they one thing that they did remove, though, is at the tail, they did have a single 20mm M2 cannon, 
but they did remove oh. it. Um, just looking at the the bull, uh, it, indeed, it doesn't have windows in those turrets for peds, so they must be automated somehow. Some kind of fucking prehistoric computers or something must have been using them. I don't know. Or, or they were no, um, manually controlled, but they were. Uh, it was, so the pilot wasn't sat. Di- the, sorry, the gunner wasn't yeah, sat directly sure. behind the gun. He right. Was what it was inside was, behind a bit of armor. Yeah, he's exactly right. It's a manual uh, system, but it's just they use a distant uh, like sight for it. Yeah. Like they're not sitting right on the gun. Yeah, they must have a periscope or something that they can see. Okay. Yeah, because the especially tail gunners in bombers had an incredibly high death rate mm-hmm. because they got shot at a lot. Right. So moving the and moving I, the gunners away from the guns is a good way to stop them dying as much. I believe the belly gunners too in the flying fortresses yep. also had a high death rate. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure there was even one case where the turret got jammed in a position where the gunner couldn't get out and the fortress had to make a belly landing. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> Minging. There were mul- multiple incidences of that. Nasty, nasty business. Okay. And just one bit of interest as well. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll come back to this multiple times. But look at the size of that B-29 and how big it is. It's a big plane. But look at the flanker above it. The flanker it just shows how big those modern fighters are. The size of it. Nearly as big as the B-29. Well, that is a full bag, though. They are larger than actual flankers. Yeah, they are, but just generally the size of it is just... Anyway, I mean, you know, the SU-34... I believe even huge. the full bag... I believe even the full bag has... An unofficial nickname of the platypus, too. Yeah, it does. It looks like one. Right, uh, let's type the B-29. Can I have just two figures from the B-29? Can I have the speed and can I have the payload, please? Uh, it would could reach 357 miles per hour. And it could either carry at 5,000 pounds of bombs at over 1,600 miles at a high altitude. 12,000 pounds of bombs at over 1,600 miles at a medium altitude or 20,000 pounds of bomb at ma- maximum over short distances at low altitude. Roger. So 20,000 pounds. That's a big step up from the Lancaster then. Okay. Let's move on, Japs, uh, to, to really what is a real bit of history and English pride. We have the Avro Vulcan. Now, we're very lucky that uh, the Afro Vulcans are all out of service now. Uh, but we have one that uh, was um, uh, brought back into service, if you like, uh, for air shows only, uh, XM557. Um, and through contributions, uh, through charities, uh, we managed, uh, which I was a part of briefly, um, we managed to get one re engineered and flying again. And we had it for four or five years flying at air shows. And tell you what an amazing plane it is! Like even it's a beautiful thing it, to see fly. Even if we yeah, had, we I wish had, I'd seen one fly. We had Riot this year, which is pretty much the biggest air show in the world. With the, you know the biggest, fastest, loudest, most impressive planes. Um, as you saw, you know we've made, just made a load of videos about it and stuff. Um, but even when we had XM five five seven, the Vulcan turning up um, in the last few years, it still outshone everything with its just general. Everythingness, its impressiveness, its loudness, its um, what it can do in the sky is just amazing. And we're talking 1950s V bomber tech. So briefly, I'll, I'll have my spiel. It was um, uh, post World War II nuclear bomb era. Uh, the bad guy was now Russia. We had to have some fast bombers that would be able to rush in and bomb Moscow or or Russia basically um, uh, so the really nasty time in history so the V bombers were created we've got a Vulcan Victor and what's the third one guys Fuck it. The Valiant the Valiant uh, this is uh, this is the first and my personal favourite designed to go bloody fast carry some bombs drop them probably not return home because the ethos was at the time that by the time you drop your bombs England would be a smouldering wreck that's what a kind of weird time in history it was uh, so um, it was uh, MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. So it was there to stop, uh, not Mr. Putin, Mr. Um, Stalin from um, sending bombs our way. That's all Wasn't I... it Gorbachev? Uh, Gorbachev was later. I think this was probably Stalin's time. He went until the mid-50s, didn't he? Probably was him. Um, someone will correct me, I'm sure. But uh, that's what I know about the Vulcan. Let's start hitting me with figures and history, guys. 
so of course the one time the Vulcan was actually used was the Falklands War. Yeah. Um, the, was already perhaps the most impressive history. feat of aerial refueling in history, mm -hmm. flying Vulcans from Ascension all the way down to the Falklands and back again mm -hmm. multiple times to bomb the runway at Port Stanley. And uh, there is an excellent book about this, which I will find on my shelf in a minute and tell you what it's called, uh, that's all about these missions. But um, they, they came up with a way of doing this ferry all the way from Ascension to... Uh, to the Falklands, um, but with, rather than doing it on computers or anything that we would do these days, all they had was a small pocket calculator that they mm -hmm. bought in a market on Ascension, <laughs> and they worked it all out on that. <laughs> so British. And I say, this is a time in history when we had, um, don't want to get too political, when we had our second best ever Prime Minister in England, uh, the best being Churchill, the second being Margaret Thatcher, and she was one of those old school people who actually cared about English people. And so um, she did this as a show of force, not really to achieve anything war, you know, tactically, but uh, to put bombs on an Argentinian-held uh, runway just to, just to show uh, that the English were supporting fellow English people. Uh, well, it was actually before, before the entire fleet could even reach that. So it was, you know, first of all, a show of force, obviously, yep. and also preparations so that the runway couldn't be used. And it actually ended up probably saving a lot of British lives because... The Argentinians ended up being very scared and uh, retreated with their uh, air fleet back to the mainland. Oh, they actually needed, I think it was 11 victors uh, for <laughs> air <laughs> refueling for this, <laughs> and it was actually oh, pretty insane. One, I mean, more th Stahl, one more thing, even with the victors, when they finished the mission, they were still almost shot down yeah, they, they, by they, an English ship. <laughs> And the thing is, they were still short on fuel, actually. They needed another refueling plane to make it back, and that was not intended. They actually fucked up the calculations a little <laughs> bit. The lols. Oh, okay. Uh, one, go ahead. One thing about it, too, is during that time, I watched a documentary on it because it was an interesting thing, that they needed to get the bombs to that runway. They were planning on how to do it, so they decided, let's bring back the Vulcan in a secret mission. Mm-hmm. And Margaret Thatcher, in her wisdom, decided, you know what, this isn't going to be a secret mission. The Vulcan was a nuclear bomber. We're going to put it on TV and put the fear of God into the Argentines that we're bringing the Vulcan back. Awesome. And so, she, so there was the broadcast for it. And since it was a nuclear bomber... They hadn't practiced dropping conventional bombs, so they were practicing on a mm -hmm. little rock off the coast. And I'm just going to put this out there. Had it not been for the environmentalists that bitched, uh, the pilots would have been able to get more bombs on the runway. Mm -hmm. They also had the problem, whilst they were practicing, of they couldn't find many iron bombs. They had to go <laughs> round every RAF base <laughs> in the country looking for iron bombs to use for practicing, because they hardly had any left. So because by this point in the Cold War, everything was nuclear, and they didn't think they'd have to use any conventional bombs anymore, so they were running out. Um, I found the book. It's called Vulcan 607 by Roland White. It's a very good book. Um, thing. Thing. Sorry, continue. And one of my favorite stories from that is from one of the later raids, because it wasn't just a single raid. The Black Buck missions were uh, several raids on the Falklands. And one of the later missions they did was a seed mission. They sent uh, Vulcans with radar-seeking missiles wow. to, um, to the Falklands and uh, they to try and blow up the um, radar-guided SAMs that the Argentines had brought in. And uh, so... To start with, they started flying these Vulcans over, and of course the Argentines switched off their radars because they didn't really want to get hit by these missiles. Um, and so on one of the missions, the Vulcan proceeded to fly backwards and forwards over the Falklands, couldn't get them to turn on the radars, so decided to drop his gear and head in for a landing on the runway, mm. uh, <laughs> which did result in them turning the missiles on, and they tried to get missiles off. Um, and then there was another mission when they, they had to abandon the mission uh, and fly back, and because they're running out of fuel. And so they tried to dump their missiles in the sea. Uh, unfortunately, only one of them came off. The other, the other missile stayed attached and armed under the Vulcan, and they had to divert to their divert base, which is in Brazil. Huh. So they ended up landing an armed Vulcan with a radar-seeking missile on a, run on a runway at a civilian airport in Brazil, um, and then had to explain to the Brazilian ground crews that there was an armed radar-seeking missile pointing almost directly at the uh, 
the air traffic control tower <laughs> uh, and they then had to get the RAF to fax the Brazilian ground crew the instructions on how to disarm one of these <laughs> missiles uh, so, so that they could get it off without it going off well, let me point out by the way I believe this time it was during Brazil's military dictatorship as well it was indeed yes <laughs> so I wonder what the thinking was when they decided let's land in Brazil <laughs> Well, it was a case of land it in Brazil or crash it into the sea. Mm. Okay. There's not that many divert bases down to the Falklands. So this uh, yeah. this is the early 80s, isn't it, the Falklands? Yes, this was the early eight, 1984, if I'm so, getting my years right. So it's important to, because a lot of people will be millennials and won't know what the hell we're talking about. So, um, or just, you know, watching 1982, the first time. 1982, sorry. 1982. So, um, and it's important to point out that, this, so this is at the end of the, this Falcon service. It you know, went into service mid-50s. Yeah, I mean, they actually the only world. wanted to take it out of service mm -hmm. before, you know, just as they were doing this mission. They did, you know, the crews thought this was never going to happen. We're never going to, you know, participate in this conflict. And they, they put the Vulcans out of service, you know, very shortly after all of this happened. Um, the insane thing is actually the air to refueling in the Vulcan, they had actually discontinued that ages ago. Mm -hmm. Never, No one had done that in like, I don't know, 10, 20 years or something because they just thought it was too bloody dangerous. And they actually had to, you know, quickly get engineers to fix all of this stuff. And according to legend, some part they needed was actually even used as an ashtray in the crew lounge. Okay. Uh no, in the documentary, they say that's legend, but apparently that was actually a thing and not just legend. One um, more thing is during that first mission, they ha actually had two Vulcans in case one went wrong. So the pilots take off in the first one, and they start hearing a slight hissing. They can't pinpoint where it is, but and they couldn't do anything about it if they did, because the only things they had to fix it was a roll of tape. Mm -hmm. And a cup of tea. And supposedly, it was like the the second time in I don't know twenty years or so that that had happened. Yeah, <laughs> so and was it, wasn't it like the what's it called for the window it had like cracked or something? I forget what exactly it was, but anyway, the plane basically just uh, depressurized and they had to turn around. So it was actually the backup Vulcan that eventually did the mission on its own. Very good. Okay. I just uh, and just reading you a little bit more about this uh, the divert to Brazil mission which was with Black Buck Six. The reason they had to divert is because they broke their refueling probe, Oops. and so they couldn't uh, they couldn't refuel, and so they landed in Brazil. Um, but apparently, this was a bit of a a bit of a sort of diplomatic incident because uh, no one knew before that point that the United States had been giving the British Shrike anti radiation missiles. Mm -hmm. And so Britain had to negotiate for the release of the Vulcan and the crew, which apparently was done as a deal in exchange for Britain giving Brazil spare parts for Lynx helicopters, uh, which Brazil wanted. Okay. Um, so yeah, they uh, they they had to give them. They effectively bribed the Brazilians with spare parts for their helicopters, repaired the Vulcan, and then flew it home. Awesome. But the, oh, the Brazilians got to keep the spare missile. One thing, too, that I am reading about it, too, um, it was, it eventually landed at the Galeão Airport, and I, I've actually been there, it's a pretty nice airport nowadays. The Vulcan was intercepted by two F-5 Tiger IIs that were mm. scrambled from Santa Cruz. Awesome. Okay. Uh, just a couple the of things. The they had left when they landed was not enough to do a single circuit of the airport. Well, I mean. Go down so on. they only had two thousand pounds of fuel left, which was not enough to do a go around. So okay. that's how much fuel it was burning. A couple of things, uh, just I've been thinking about while you guys have been talking. So, uh, in its first, I mean, there were two versions. There was the there was the uh, uh, the I can't remember. There's version one and version two. Version one had a straight wing. That was the early one. Version two had a curved wing, which is the infamous one that we know now as the the big evoke. Version one was painted in bomb blast white. I remember. Um, so the whole thing was white, and that is because to help absorb the um, the rays from the nuclear bomb as it nuked Russia, basically. Um, yep, um, anti-radiation white. Anti-radiation white, yep. Uh, also, it was made uh, famous in a 
James Bond movie. Now, my memory is slowly coming back. I think it was Thunder, Thunderball or something. I've forgotten the name of the James Bond movie. But they, um, the, the Russians in that steal nukes. They crash a load of Vulcans into the water. And then the Vulcans sink down. And then they steal a load of nukes from it. And then James Bond has to go and... Ah, yes. Yes, I remember that one. I can't... I, I just it's Thunderball, a, I think. Yes, yes Thunderball. Thunderball. Okay, well, let's get on. I mean, this, yeah, I think we'll... Actually, one last little fact. Yeah. Um, that Vulcan did their first mission on their own way on the Falklands is actually now uh, placed as a monument on Excited at the airport. Oh, really? The actual bird? Wow, well, okay. Uh, yep, I've, uh, I know where two of these are. No, I know where three of these are in real life. Uh, so I get to, I'm lucky I get to see them uh, when I can move. Uh, anyway, so we must move on. Let's just quickly do facts and figures. I uh, believe they've got the Avon engines, the same one as in the Concorde. Um, have we got a power on rating on these engines? Give me a second to find it. Um, so the four Bristol Olympus engines... Oh, my bad. Um, Sorry, I meant to yeah, say... Yeah, they're Olympus was... engines, £11,000 of force each out of the four engines... Yep. Maximum right. speed six hundred and forty five miles an hour, cruise speed five hundred and sixty seven, range of two thousand six hundred miles. Thank you. And does it have a yeah, I meant sorry, I meant to say Olympus. Does it uh, have a I know it's not designed to carry lots of bombs, does it have a maximum bomb load, just out of interest? Twenty one thousand pound bombs or one nuclear bomb. Okay, so it is still competitive with B twenty nine and you know there's big things in the amount of carry, so okay, interesting. Right. Anything to add final thoughts from the Vulcan before we move on? There are three of them in the U.S. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Do we know how many were made out of interest? Um, they were 136, including the prototypes. That's a fair old amount for a big bomber. Okay. Right, we're going to move on to... Uh, that's, uh, that's a lovely bit of history. Great aeroplane. Uh, very, very famous. We're going to move on to TSR-2. Not a famous aircraft, but just as amazing. Now, I'm going to turn my fan on because I'm sweating to death here, so sorry about the noise it's going to create, but... Uh, I, there's a reason why I have my AC on in the background. Oh, oh that's a bit better. Better. Lucky you having AC. I've just got a window open. Uh, I've got a fan on now. Right, oopsie. Um, a walking stick just fell over. Let's put that over there. Right, TSR2. Now, uh, we've got, I think, only two were built. I may be wrong there, but there weren't many. Three, three, three were built. One of them is, I, I'm lucky enough to live near RAF Duxford, which is an Imperial War Museum, which has got a lot of these planes, uh, pretty half of them you can see on the screen, we've got them at Duxford. Um, and um, in it is the TSR-2. Now, when I used to go there as a youngster, which is one of the things that got me into aeroplanes, I used to see this bird, and it, it was a weird thing. I, uh, I didn't know what it was at the time. I didn't understand any history about it. It was a tiny little wing, big, long fuselage, ugly-looking thing. I had no interest in what it was. It just looked weird. But it always caught my eye about how weird it is and how you know interesting uh, I, you know what i wonder why it was in this big museum next to the b-52 in the vulcan and then i learned about it and it turns out it was a really really advanced ahead of a typically english at the time in the cold war really forward thinking way ahead of the time just unfortunately like a lot of planes in england and america the wrong place at the wrong time and politics ended up destroying it as it does with a lot of good technology uh, so we've got here a low-level supersonic bomber. Oh, uh, of, of does anyone know? I know it didn't make it service, but what kind of time in history this was? Uh, the first flight was in '64. Yeah, 1964. So that's pretty. That's pretty early on, and its capabilities or its, or its claimed capabilities. It was fast. I remember. Um, so it had 2.35 was its maximum speed at altitude. So it was very, very fast. Um, designed to carry 10,000 pounds of bombs. Yep, now that is, now we've just got to put it, put it into perspective here. So this is uh, nearly 10 years ahead of the F-15, uh, which could do Mach 2.5 completely clean. This is 10 years ahead, and this is a big, this is a big, um, this is not a fighter, this is a big nuclear bomber, and it could go nearly as fast, Mach 2.35, um, you just got to think how ahead of the game we are at the moment, what piece of tech it is. Uh, okay, carry on, guys. So, yeah, yeah three made. Uh, one's at Duxford. The, there is another one at RAF Cosford, where the RAF Museum is. Mm -hmm. And the other one has been taken apart. Apparently, two of its engines are at Gatwick Air Aviation Museum, and the cockpit is at Brooklyn's Museum. 
Roger, what are the engines and what are they rated at? Uh, it's the Bristol Siddeley Olympus, oh. and at afterburner it made 30,610 wow. pounds. So these are the same, essentially the same engines, the Olympus engines that were in the Vulcan and the Concorde. Concorde. Absolutely, yeah, they are the same engines. Uh, 30,000 pounds, so that's a big thumping engine on afterburners, so that's why it went so far. And I remember it had tiny, diddy little wings, God knows how they got this to fly. This is before computer modelling, aerodynamic modelling and stuff. Um, and I remember pictures of this flight landing on aircraft carriers. Is that my imagination or is that a thing, do we know? I'm not seeing anything about the aircraft carrier landings here. Okay, maybe that's my imagination. Yeah, maybe either. Okay. Um, it seems uh, very big to get down on a carrier. Yeah. All right, scratch that for now then. Um, do we have a bomb? Uh, so we've got the speed on this, we've got the time, date. Obviously, it never made it into history. It was crushed by bloody Labour government. Or grr. And um, do we have the bomb load on this? It must have been a, a, a nuclear bomber, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, it could carry in total 10,000 pounds, which was one. With initially one red beard, 15 kiloton nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. or two XOR 1177-300 kiloton nuclear weapon, or 6,000 pounds high explosive bombs. Roger. So it didn't have a massive bomb load, but it was really there to take a red beard over. Um, what about the cockpit? A pilot and a navigator, I'm guessing? Or didn't they even get that uh, far? I believe so. Anyone else got any information? It sounds like information is scarce. Yeah, yeah crew, crew of two. There's not very much about it due no. to the fact that it never really made it. Um, I was looking and the, the reason it got cancelled was basically because they didn't have anyone to sell it to and it was at the same time that the Americans were developing the F-111. Mm -hmm. um, and so the British tried to sell it to the Australians but they decided to buy the F-111 instead. Mm -hmm. um, and then the RAF were asked to consider buying the F-111 and cancelling this plane to save money and that's what was decided um, even though uh, the employees of the company that were making it, BAC ha held a protest march um, but the government decided that the F-111 would be cheaper and so they agreed an option to buy up to 110 of those mm -hmm. from, the, from America if we wanted them. Roger, shame. I wish the TSR-2 would have become a thing. I think it would have been a right beast to have it in service. All right, guys. Uh, good job for digging that dirt up. Um, there is an hour-long uh, video, probably on YouTube nowadays somewhere, about the TSR-2. If you're interested in it, it is a very good watch. <coughs> Excuse me. So I suggest you go, and if you get time, go and have a look at that. Okay, guys. Let's move on to Boeing big company as we know. Now the first thing is, I've never heard of this, this is a B-47E Stratojet um, and excuse me, a massive bomber with a fighter cockpit question mark um, and turbojet engines uh, what do we know about this and when was it? When is this It was six turbojets first flew in 47 and introduced in 51 it retired the 47E in the EB-47E. Only the Air Force, the Air Force was the primary user with 2,032 of them built. 2,032 of them? Yes. Wow, that's amazing, considering I didn't know this existed. So this... Yeah, the, the issue it had uh, was it was subsonic. It was very close to supersonic, but it was a subsonic jet. So... Yes. I see swept wings... To an extent, I see old school turbojet engines, six engines. So this is our first American's first attempt at a big. I'm guessing, or you know, not the V first maybe, but um, the first in this list at least of of uh, jet large scale bomber. Yeah, it, its first flight was the 17th of December 1947. So this was coming straight out of World War Two. They were developing yeah. this as effectively a first stab at a jet bomber. Right. Um, okay. And so it stayed, it was introduced, as we said, in 1951, was used as a bomber until 65, and then was used a little bit later as reconnaissance aircraft and testing aircraft. Okay, um, so it never saw service, it never dropped bombs anywhere, it must have been too far before. Uh, did it drop bombs in Korea? Was it too out of service? Yeah, by just doing a little, little bit of research. Because that was before B-52s, I think. There are... Out of the 2,032 airframes, 
that were made, uh, there are about 25 surviving in museums, in museum collections worldwide. Now, first thing I notice is it's um, the first bomber after World War II that I see that's not covered in machine guns. Um, do we know what the doctrine was at that time? They must have had... So, the idea, the idea with the Stratajet was we don't need machine guns because we can fly high and fast so interceptors can't get to us. Right. Which, right. of course, was a little bit defeated by supersonic interceptors. Well, yeah, um, that's, that's it, of course. But Yeah. As far as I can see from its operational history, it was only ever, it was used in a couple of nuclear tests, but mm. never actually in real combat. Okay, so we have some facts and figures. What was the power output on each engine? Uh, the had six General Electric J forty sevens at yep one over engine seven thousand two hundred pounds of thrust. Interesting, the same engine found in the Sabre. Yes, that's exactly where I knew that engine from. Yep, so it's a bunch of whole six Sabre engines, okay. Do we have a speed, a payload, and a range? Uh, 607 max speed, they, it would cruise at 547 Is that miles, miles per hour? Per hour. Um, yeah, miles yeah. per hour. And its combat radius was 2,013 miles with 20,000 pounds bomb load. So that's pretty far, really, but bear in mind that's heavy. So that's yeah, fine. Yes. Yeah. And it Max could ferry, ferry at 4,647 miles. Mm -hmm. Maximum bomb load, 25,000 uh, pounds, including either one big nuclear bomb or two tactical nuclear bombs. And it did actually have some guns. It had two 20mm autocannons in the tail. Yeah, but it was that. much less than, of course, the, the sort of hedgehog of machine guns of, Se yeah. of the Second World War. Okay. Well, I mean, you also can't forget, if you want to go fast, you can't have this many protrusions, it's just mm -hmm. going to... Absolutely, you've got to be yeah. more yeah. Uh, streamlined if you want to go quickly. It could carry 28 500 pound conventional bombs, Cap. Wow, so that's okay. So, in the history of things, in, in the timeline that we've been working through, this is so far the fastest uh, plane with the longest range and the heaviest bomb load. So, this is pretty fun actually. This thing had a, a radio belt which you could jettison with 33 rocket engines. Wow. So, if you really wanted to get this thing up in the air quickly, that's, that's pretty good. The thing that the thing that I find I find weird is the bubble fighter style canopy. It's almost a fighter front. I just found that weird for a bomber. Yeah, it is a, it is a weird design. Yeah, it is a f looks like a fighter front. It's almost but like the, the but the crew are three. Oh really? It's almost like they they they've got good visibility, so they can look out for hostile MIGs coming at them or something like that. I was just that possibly might have been it. Need, needed good visibility. Maybe also used for reconnaissance or something is that a possibility yeah. mm -hmm. it was, I believe it was a recon plane as well yeah it was used for recon as well as bombing and it stayed in recon a long, longer than it did uh, as a bomber ok guys an interesting piece of history uh, anything to what? tie up the 4-7 yeah I'm looking at the accident and incident list for it it's a decently sized list oh dear what was, what was the main problems with it a good engine so uh, one of them crashed into a trailer park. Mm -hmm. One exploded near Wichita, Kansas. Another one had engine problems and crashed. Silly Boeing. N another had wing failure and crashed. What the fuck did he do? Another one exploded in mid-air. <laughs> There was one in a mid-air collision with a saber. Hmm. Okay. They both crashed in Spain. Yeah, they well, both crashed with a nuclear bomb. There's only 23 left. None of them airworthy, and they're all in various museums all over America. Mm -hmm. In 1958, apparently, actually, one crashed with a nuclear bomb, which didn't blow, but it did. Uh, still, you know, radiate the entire area, so they actually had to evacuate the population. Yeah, I saw a video yeah, on that. that. Yeah, that's a big thing that happened. It crashed with a full, with an armed nuke on it. Is that the one that was never worried. found, or was that a B-52? That, that was a B-52. No, um, I think that's the B-52 one, and I believe that was, like, near England that it dropped it. Like, in um, the waters. There is actually one here as well. 
apparently after crashing into an F-86 at the, at the coast of Georgia. A uh, hydrogen bomb was mm -hmm. actually dropped, was jettisoned from 2,200 meters altitude into the Atlantic, and they never found that thing. Oopsie! Just throwing around those new One like accidental uh, nuclear bomb. Two B 47s failed on the same date in separate incidents when lowering wings, wing skin, when the lower wing skin failed at approximately the same uh, structural location. God. It sounds like it had a very checkered history. There's not a one that sounds like I would the, not want to fly one. <laughs> there's one that just lost a nuclear bomb. <laughs> Didn't even say how, just lost it. <laughs> me. It gets very scary if you start looking at lists of how many nuclear weapons have been lost. Oh yeah. I'm pretty sure there is a few in the English Channel. <laughs> and one of them crashed and it was never confirmed that there was a nuke involved, but uh, according to the high concentration of uh, radioactive contamination on the base, it's very likely. <laughs> Evolves. Oh, interesting. I found an instant. 27th of July 1956 in Britain, a B 47 crashed into a nuclear weapons storage facility at Lake. <laughs> in Suffolk. Oh, like, yeah, I live there. Uh, during a trip. training exercise. Can you uh, just the nuclear storage B47? facility contained three Mark VI bombs. The bomb disposal officers said it was a miracle that one of the explosive, uh, one of the bombs didn't go oh, off God. because they sheared the detonators off it, but the bomb didn't go off. Uh. So there was so very nearly a nuclear explosion at Lake and Heath, thanks to one of these things. Let's <laughs> just conclude that B 47s and nukes hey, do not mix. Hey. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> that, I'm glad that was just giving you a scare for burning down the White House. I'm glad, I'm glad you didn't explode, otherwise, Cap would never ex have existed. So, uh, right. Well, here's another one 1958, a B 47 at Greenham Common in England. Was it, we had a nuclear weapon on board, caught fire and completely <laughs> burned. <laughs> Stop have, dropping nuclear bombs all over England, for fuck's sake. At him, March 10th, 1956, a B-47 carrying two nuclear weapon cores from McDill Air Force Base in Florida to an overseas base disappeared during a scheduled air-to-air oh -air refueling over the Mediterranean Sea. So the only one I can see here that didn't crash or drop nuclear bombs somewhere was actually shot down by a uh, Soviet MiG-19. And, and all the in 1960, it was a recon plane, and it shed its nuclear bomb load all over Russia. Well, if it, it if it had a nuclear bomb, it probably wasn't a recon plane. Oh yes, right. Okay, so I'm I kind of understand why I haven't heard about it now because it sounds like they all crash and drop nuclear bombs around the world. What an interesting piece of history? Question mark. The Vulcan never did all this. Why did the Boeing B-47 have to do it? Well, maybe just British engineering for you. And British engineering. See, we just we just break our pedo tubes or whatever refueling tubes. We don't drop bombs everywhere. You see, because you never truly flew with a nuclear armament, Cap. Mm, yeah, well, bloody good reason for it as well. Right, okay. Well, I right. probably <laughs> learned from the Americans. <laughs> don't fly with nukes mm. on the plane. On that horrifically depressing note, let's uh, move on to the B-50D. Now, I'm not sure if we're, if we're out of phase or something, but when was this a, a thing? The B-52? The no, the B-50 five, five Delta. Where the <laughs> hell are you seeing that, Cap? It's the other one under the B-47. It appears to be, we've gone back to turbo, we've gone back to prop engines by the looks of it. Are you looking at a different picture? Because under yeah, the B-47 is the B-52. <laughs> For me, yeah, it's okay. a B-50 D Super Fortress. Uh, we must have different versions, question Yeah, mark. we have a B-52 Strata Fortress. Okay, right. Uh, out of interest for the fans who are looking at what I've got here, uh, what is this B five zero D Super Fortress that's just above the B fifty two? Let me quickly do some research. Yeah, it's it's the first link. Cap posted one link. Someone else posted a higher resolution link. Ah, uh, they're not identical. I only checked the first few. Uh, uh, let me do a quick Wikipedia search for that. Alright, so yeah, so the B the B fifty is the post World War Two revision of the B twenty nine that they did the upgrades on, gave it better engines and a better structure. What so it's very very similar to the B twenty nine. Oh, I, 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 th I thought it gave it a new number. I thought it looked like it. Just out of interest, I'm just trying to work out why it is after the B forty seven. What date is this thing gone into service? So this was uh, first flight twenty fifth of June nineteen forty seven. Introduced nineteen forty eight. Right. Okay. Retired sixty five. 
Okay, so we've already been over the B29, so we won't go over it, but okay, fair yeah, enough. basically the same plane, they did some upgrades and it got a new number. There's actually one interesting fact about it. In 1949, the Lucky Lady 2 with the US pilot captain James G. Gallagher, the first uh, non-stop uh, go-around the world was actually done using this aircraft. Hmm. In 94 hours, and it was air to refueled over the, how do you say that, the source or something, Saudi Arabia and the Philippines as well as Hawaii. Interesting piece of history. Okay. Okay, chaps, and I know you're going, when I say you're talking about this, you're never going to stop, but we're moving on to the Stratofortress. Now everyone knows the B 52. Why does everyone know the B-52? Because it just won't yeah. die. Um, it's God knows when it, it went into history in the in the fifties, and it's still flying, and it will probably still be flying in another fifty years or something. Um, we should start out talking about when you know, rather than what it's used for nowadays. Let's start talking about its early history, why it came into history, when it came into history, and you know what was the doctrine. So its first flight was the fifteenth of April, nineteen fifty-two, and it was introduced February, nineteen fifty-five. So it has been serving for, what, 68 years at this point? Uh, and is, it's currently expected to be served into the 2050s. So over 100 years. So it's going to serve for about 100 years. Which is longer than any other plane. Yeah, it's longer than planes that have existed almost up to now. If you think the right flyer to now is only just a little bit longer than mm -hmm. how long this will serve for. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know... As we always say, there's been different versions, but essentially the airframe is more or less the same from back in the 50s. I have vivid memories. Vivid memories. We used to have um, uh, something called the RAF before uh, America went all stingy and stopped helping UK. We used to get some lovely air shows um, called the Mildenhall Air Show in England every year. And the Americans used to come over with their pride and joy aircraft, B1s, B-52s, B2s, SR-71 at the time. And I have vivid memories of these things doing air shows, almost like fighters. It's huge, and it was an enormous thing. I mean, look at the size of it compared to the, to the Lincoln slash Lancaster. It's twice the size, absolutely enormous thing designed for, was it designed for carpet bombing or for nuclear drops? Um, both. And both. It, was, yeah, it, was it was designed both. to be a multi-purpose plane. Yeah, it uh, was. Clear. I believe it was the first bomber. Might have been. I might be wrong on this. That could carry over fifty thousand pounds. Because wow. it could carry seventy thousand pounds of bombs. She yeah, it, is it had ridiculous. a range of eight thousand eight hundred miles without refueling. So this thing has just stepped up in every way. So it's we're not just adding a few thousand pounds to the uh, to the payload. We're timesing it by two, timesing it yeah. by three at this point. Um, so and it just wants to basically bomb the whole world, and it can go. I mean, I'm guessing this was this is Cold War, obviously. So this is to get bombs in Russia at the end of the day, isn't it? Yep. Eight thousand miles yep. away. Yeah, and what you were saying about the airframes are basically the same. They stopped building them in 1962. Oh, so yeah, wow. the, uh, they made 744 of them. There are currently 58 in active service and 18 more in reserve. So there's still there's still those. 50 year old for airframe 60 year old airframe yeah they, the about. latest they could have been built was 1962 because that's when they shut down production that's very impressive and in july 2013 the air force began a fleet-wide technological upgrade for it yeah i mean obviously to be to be this far ahead they would have had they would have had huge upgrades every 10 years or something seems to be the usual thing yeah um, e 52 was carpet bombing in Vietnam and it's still carpet bombing in Afghanistan. So it must have been, yeah, so it must have been too late for Korean War. Um, you know, it only, if it had only gone into service in 52, probably too late to really be having an impact there. But it, it was prevalent in uh, the uh, Vietnamese War, obviously. And yeah. I'm guessing they were carpet bombing uh, Ho Chi Minh and whatnot with um, conventional munitions. Yes, Operation Rolling Thunder dropping horrendously large amounts of bombs over the whole of Vietnam. Um, the, the number, I need to find it, but it is a huge number of bombs they dropped. Oh, Roger. Um, I believe that I get, I'm getting this quote probably from Top Gear. Jimmy Clarks had said it in the Vietnam special they did when they still were in the mm -hmm. BBC. Yeah, I remember that. That most, if not almost every landmark that is now a tourist staple in Vietnam, like natural looking stuff like waterfalls, rivers and that stuff, 
were all made by the U.S. dropping bombs. Ah, unbelievable. Yeah, I can't. I don't imagine the amount of bombs that were dropped. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. The notable thing about the B-52 and the U.S. during the Vietnam War is that what inevitably lost the war was Gerald Ford coming into office. Because if you watch a documentary when they started leaving Vietnam, it ex they explain that when Nixon was in office, the Vietnam War was still going. The, NV the North Vietnamese feared the U.S. air power at the time. And Nixon, when he started pulling out, said that we're pulling out. If you try anything, we'll bring the U.S. air power back. And that that is a statement on how the B-52 was. The mm -hmm. eventually Operation Rolling Thunder was a failure because the plan for it was to bomb the ever-living hell out of them and destroy morale, which never works but especially on people that walk on foot and hide in tunnels mm -hmm. if you put yes, a big crater on there they'll walk through it they're not mm -hmm. driving big trucks it was all on foot and on bikes i mean mm -hmm. if in world war Two the germans couldn't break british morale and the british couldn't break german morale why how is the u.s going to break the morale of someone that hides in tunnels mm -hmm. and for a sense of scale in world war Two, total tonnage of bombs was 2.15 million tons in the Vietnam War, uh, the Americans on uh, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam dropped 7.6 million wow. tons of bombs. Three so three feet. times as many as in the whole of World War that II. Is, yeah, that is, really, that is really incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's something like two and a half million cluster bombs. I'm not sure. It's a ridiculously I'm large number of, of weapons. That. No, they, there is a reason... Um, Sorry, 260 million cluster bombs. Jeez. There's a reason those things are banned now. Yeah, absolutely. So that is a They're not banned. The US still use them. It's uh, an agreement that was signed by some things. country. It was an agreement signed by some countries, the US being not one of them. Okay, well, I think we The Americans are great at not signing weapons treaties. So I think we can go. agree that was a lo low point of history. But okay, let's carry on about the bird itself. So it would have started with a, um, a gun, uh, four guns, I think, at the back with a man sitting in it, then a radar guided gun, and now just uh, ECM or whatever that is. Uh, uh, what right. about the engines, guys? What, what in, we're going to, we've got eight, but what motors have we got in there? Eight so currently, an ETF 33s. And what and route they rated at? 17,000 pounds. Wow, each. really? That's, so that's a powerful. And you can see why it's so powerful. It's massive. Look at the size of the engine. So that is eight times seventeen thousand pounds thrusters. That's that's really impressive. And they're big, smoky, loud engines. Very impressive bird to watch. Also, weird landing gear, because the body is so thin, and the wings so high. There was nowhere to put the landing gear, so they had to kind of. I can't really explain it, but you you just look watch a video of one of these th things trying to land, and it's weird tricycle landing gear. It's very uh, weird to watch. No, one thing that's notable about the B-52 is that being the big plane that it is, you wouldn't think it could maneuver, but it, it could. And unfortunately, a pilot, he, in 94, was practicing for an air show, and I believe he was a fighter pilot before, and he started trying to pull moves that fighter planes would pull. And there's a video, and currently on Wikipedia, there's a picture of it, which was the Caesar 52 before crashing while practicing at the air show in 94 and I'll post it in media so you can see the picture cap no oh, I know yeah he did a he did a wing over in a whatever this is a hundred fifty ton plane so what do you expect uh, is gonna happen pick up a knife drop it on the floor that's how the plane looks at the moment in the picture no drum okay Interestingly, um, um, there's a current program going on in America. They're trying to give it new uh, laser defense weapons for shooting down SAMs and air-to-air -air missiles. That'd be interesting. I'd like that on my plane. That's actually one very uh, important fact we're missing out on. There's actually a guy who on YouTube, you know, who just does videos on licking stuff on YouTube, and he actually broke into a U.S. Air Force base and licked a B-52. Ah. Until you got tackled by security. No. Yeah, I was see, gonna say, time where you'd be how shot. did you get all the way to a B-52? You see, there is a time where you would be shot for breaking into a military base. I'm surprised he wasn't, to be honest. Honestly, it was probably because it was an Air Force base. 
Okay, gentlemen. Um, can we get some more facts and figures? Uh, we've got the bomb load. We've got everything. Uh, we've got the range. What's? I know it's not a speed bomber, but out of interest, what speed? Max speed did we have for this bird? Five hundred sixty kilo. Five hundred sixty knots. Uh, not 650 miles per hour. It's the fastest plane so far uh, in the timeline. Okay, well, it's pretty amazing aircraft. Anything to add to the 52 before we move on? Um, it can carry both the sniper advance targeting pod and the lightning pod. Oh, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Okay, guys, let's crack on. We've got the Convair. Something almost as impressive, believe it or not, although not... Uh, that's prevalent in history. We have a Convair B36 Peacemaker. Now, I don't know a lot about this, but it looks weird. It looks like it's half jet, half uh, turbo prop or piston prop. I don't know. Um, oh, the one with the, with the propellers on the back of the yeah. wing. Yeah. Well, tell me about this. I mean, first of all, physically, it's, a, it's bigger than the B52, so it's impressive. Um, when was this in history? Let's try and find out when and why this existed. So this was a contemporary of the B-50. So it first flew in 1946, was introduced in 1949. Um, is interesting, the, has the largest wingspan of any combat aircraft ah. ever built at 70 metres. Amazing. And was the first bomber capable of delivering a nuclear weapon without, without being modified. So Enola Gay was a modified B-29. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was the first thing that was purpose-built for nukes. And did you say when it was, sorry? Uh, introduced in 1949, so a contemporary of the B-50. Okay, right, so the B-50, way before the B-52, okay. Absolutely, yeah, it was replaced by the B-52. Right, how many were those? Uh, there were a lot. 384. That was a lot, yeah. Okay, they didn't see any service, even though they were around in Korea. As far as I know, they didn't see any, ac sorry, they didn't see any action. Um, um, and they've got a weird propulsion system. They've got six, by the looks of it, six propeller and engines, and some, I don't know how many, jet engines. What was this all about? Yeah, uh, so they've got six um, Pratt & Whitney Wasp Major radial engines yep, and four J47 turbojets. Wow. So four, again, of the Sabre engines uh, that we were talking about earlier, and uh, six radial engines, which were those... Um, the ones used for the props. Uh, the same thing is used on the H4 Hercules yeah. um, and the Strato Freighter as well, which was a uh, a, a, a uh, transport There's variant. Ten engines in this bloody thing. Yes, what, ten engines for the whole. What could, what could go wrong? Okay. Um, anything else we know about this uh, bomb load and speed, please? Mm -hmm. Out of it. Bomb load eighty six thousand pounds, oh, so even my... more than the B fifty two. Wow. At 86,000 pounds of bombs. Yeah, that was. What a beast. Yeah, 72,000 pounds normally, 86,000 pounds absolute maximum. Jeez. That was. Told you I was wrong about the B 52 being the first to carry over 50. <laughs> that was an impressive piece of gear. And it had a crew of 13. I can't find a list of what they were all doing. 15. 13 people on board. Wow. No, I read 15. Okay. okay. It must have bloody just to look after the bombs. Eighty-six thousand pounds of bomb. I'm just I'm struggling to understand why this went out of service to the B-52. It carries more. It probably goes further. Um, 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 it was at the time I believe it was the only American bomber that can take off from the U.S. in bomb Russia. It was yeah, it's combat radius just shy of four thousand miles. Oh, so that's a lot less. Very range ten thousand. Okay. That's and it was also an awful lot slower than the B-52. That's its maximum the thing. speed was 235, cruising at 230. Ah, uh, there it that's is. not that much more than the World War II planes. Right. So because it's a prop. So the props are the, the limiting factor. So the problem was the speed. Well, so it was big, it had decent range, it had a huge payload, but it just wasn't fast enough, and speed was important in the Cold War. Absolutely. Uh, as soon as you get missiles and jet interceptors, this thing is next to useless. It'll dark. just get shot down. Right. Oh, one notable thing about it, this was involved in the first loss of an American atom bomb. What was that? How's that? Are we going back to our lost nuclear weapons? Yes, this was the first aircraft that lost the US an Let's atom bomb. See. It was actually involved in two broken arrow incidents, and in 1950, one crashed and into an unpopulated re region of British Columbia, uh, resulting in the first loss of an American atom bomb. 
um, and the bomb's plutonium core was a dummy was dummy lead but it did have TNT in it interesting okay uh, anything else about the B-56 guys uh, I think that's about it for the B thirty six. It's sorry, B thirty six. It's an impressive piece of kit. Whatever, you, whatever we say. Yeah, about it, is, it is a very interesting plane. Okay, um, so then we had the B fifty two take over because it was a lot faster by the sounds of it. And then moving on to the doctrine of speed, we have this the B fifty eight. So at this point, we thought, okay, we've got these big bombers. We can go and bomb Russia, but our planes simply aren't fast enough. They're getting intercepted by. Uh, I don't think they had the MiG 25s yet, but they had uh, they had supersonic fighters that could boom up like the MiG 21, zoom up and shoot these things down. We need something that can go really fast and still drop a nuclear bomb to scare. Um, must be we must be past Stalin now, but whoever took off after Stalin, uh, what's his name, guys? Um, fucking. Isn't it Gorbachev? No, before Gorbachev, there was a big fat white haired dude. Uh, Rush now. No, uh, let me let me check the list. I have a list up. Uh, you guys say Stalin's a much better way to freak me out. It freaks me out every time you do shit. Khrushchev? No, is it Khrushchev? Maybe yeah, it was it's Khrushchev. I just Google. Yes, Jack, it was Khrushchev since, in the sixties. Since I've yeah. since of because of the name of it, I have to make this joke. Um, if this plane was in ever went to Hogwarts, it would be in the house of Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff. Wow! Get out. <laughs> anyway, okay. moving on. So this was the first ever jet bomber capable of Mach two. Yeah. So that that was its that was its big record. And so that's that's an impressive piece of kit. So give me a date, please. I'm guessing it's 50, 1958. First, first flight, nineteen fifty six. Introduced, nineteen sixty. Nineteen sixty. And let's just compare that to uh, the TSR two. That was nineteen sixty four. Was Mach two point three four. And this is Mach 2, so, so it's pretty impressive. And it doesn't look that fast. The reason I say it is it's got those giant four big engines, those giant four engine nacelles. And the one thing about engine nacelles on a wing is that they're not very aerodynamic. Um, so no, they're really not. Uh, so how did it get this fast? What, what are those engines and what power are they kicking out? So they're General Electric J79, same ah, thing found on the F4 Phantom and the Starfighter. Yeah, I know all about it's my favourite engine of all time. And they, I know they are very powerful, so I can understand why it's so 10, fast. 10,400 pounds each, 15,600 with the afterburner. Yep, so that is over 60,000 pounds. Of, um, yeah, 62,000 pounds at full afterburner. So you could get it to Mach 2, and the idea was you could go fast and high enough that the MiG simply couldn't get it in time and this is this is a real thing um, we've done missions before where we've sent F-15s in to attack a, a target that's easily defendable but because this F-15 is going so high and so fast the QRA fighters just can't scramble up quick enough to get it and that's the same thing here it was I guess it was probably a one use only fighter that it was up to, to bomb and then by the time it drops this bomb and then that's it, it turn around and if it's got a home to go to it would um yeah. so and service ceiling of sixty three thousand feet as well so it could go really really high as well as yeah. really, really fast just just as important as uh, as going fast so this scared so i remember someone saying last video it is this is one of the one of the one thing that scared stalin and khrushchev they just couldn't find anything to shoot this down hence it's led to the mig 25 and blah 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 but yeah so at the time they had nothing to shoot this down uh, which is interesting. Sams couldn't shoot it down, couldn't keep up with it. Aeroplanes couldn't get up that quick. Radar couldn't find it fast enough. So it's a real good piece of kit. Now, how many were made? Do we know? Uh, 116 okay. were made. That's, that's quite a size of, of which there are eight left. Okay, I'd love to see one in real life if I ever get to see. Go to America. America. I'd like to. See yeah, that. again, all in America at various uh, museums. Okay. Um, I'm assuming one of them is in California. So, Cap, when you come to the nursery in California, feel free to go check out the museum. There are there are two uh, in California. One at Edwards Air Force Base and one at Castle Air Museum. Cool. Okay. So we've got the speed of this thing. We know about the engines. Uh, not that it's particularly pertinent, but uh, what is the payload and the range? So, one B fifty three or four B B forty threes or B sixty one nuclear bombs. Mm -hmm. About twenty thousand pounds worth. It's pretty impressive. But one or four nuclear bombs, depending on what it's carrying. Twenty thousand pounds, so it's comparable to this uh, B uh, twenty nine type payload, and it's about the same size. So it's a big old thunder chunky of a thing. Um, and do we have a range on this thing? Not very far. 
Uh -huh. uh, its range was combat radius 1700 miles, ferry range 4100. Right, so they would have been firing these off from Lakenheath and Mildenhall in um, eastern England then I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, this, was, this is definitely a sort of more of a frontline tactical bomber than a, uh, a strategic bomber. Roger. Looking at it, one conclusion I'm getting at is this was the Americans Vulcan. <laughs> yep. Yep. Pretty much. Yeah, it is. It is a similar contemporary to the Vulcan. Yes, Such a before, but going for a very sort of different way of doing it. Yeah, Vulcan on steroids because we're going Mac Two here. So uh, interesting. Okay, anything? Uh, it's obviously a very uh, notorious piece of kit. Anything to add to the Hustler before we sign off on that? Uh, the front looks very much like a B1 Lancer to me, but should probably know the here nor there. Okay, guys, we're doing well. Two more planes to go. Uh, one, uh, the next one is the Mirage 4, and this is something, this is something, I've always been really interested in this plane, don't know anything about it, uh, I used to have uh, airfix models when I was a kid, and a Mirage 1, a Mirage uh, 3, and a Mirage 4, and I didn't really understand the concepts of bombers, I was a tiny kid at the time, and, and just the Mirage 4, we had two engines, and it was really big, and I was just always fascinated about this aircraft, how big it was, and why it was a thing. Uh, well, so let's start off, uh, Mirdasso, when in history uh, was this thing made? So, uh, first flight 1959, introduced 1964. 59. So I just looking at the stats, and this is basically a French Hustler. Its stats are very, very similar, and it's and it's definitely a contemporary. Ah, so it's a new fast nuclear bomber. I didn't, I wasn't aware of yeah, that. Yeah, Mac 2.2 nuclear wow. bomber. Wow, how interesting. It's a Delta Wing, it's a Delta Wing. Um, variant. Uh, hang on. Well, the bus Hustler was a Delta, wasn't it, or was it not? Yeah, Hustler yeah. was a Delta, I think. Yeah. Right. Interesting. I think it's one of the only U.S. Deltas. So, if you want to go fast at the time, you had you had Deltas. Okay. So, yeah. uh, what were those motors it's got on there? So, in these, we are running uh, uh, SNECMA ETARS turbojets. Um, used on the Mirage 3, the Mirage F1, and the Super Etonard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Derived from a German World War II design, apparently. Uh, oh. Designed by BMW. What power? So, with these, we're looking at £11,000 each dry, 15800 with afterburner. So, again, very, very similar Jeez, to the 76s that were in the Hustler. 79s, yeah. Um, 79s, even, sorry. Okay, um, uh, it's a lot smaller than the Hustler. The Hustler's a big, big bitch. So, it's a lot smaller. Still a big aeroplane, still bigger than an, an F-15 or something. But, yes. Um, okay, and presumably designed to take off from Paris or wherever drop a bomb on, uh, not Fritz, but uh, um, uh, uh, Moscow or something, and then RTB at Mach 2. Yeah. They had a a range, combat radius of uh, only 775 mm, miles. Wow, yeah. So, not a very long way, uh, carrying a single nuclear bomb or a nuclear missile, uh, or 16,000 pounds of conventional bombs. So, still got a decent bomb load there. But yeah, but very limited range compared to some of the others we've been talking about. And when was the service history? When did it end? So uh, the bomber variants left service in 1996, and then they were used as recon planes up to 2005. So that's a yeah, that's a damn long service history. It had then it made good use of that then. Hmm. Okay, must have been a hog to fly, big, heavy, non uh, no avionics at the time to control, no fly by wire. So an interesting plane to fly. I don't know if we're ever going to get one, but that's certainly an interesting thing. Anything to add to the Mirage 4? Okay, that's an interesting piece of history we've got there. Finally, guys, uh, we've got Douglas. Um, Douglas always seemed to make pig ugly planes for some reason, but we've got this. It's called an A3 Bravo Sky Warrior. I have no idea what this is. Is it a bomber of some kind? When in history do we have this? So we're looking at a strategic bomber of the US Navy. Uh, first flight 1952, introduced 1956, uh, and is a carrier-based aircraft, ah, so our first right. carrier bomber. Right, okay, got two jets, is that right? Two jet engines? Uh, yes, one under each wing. Doesn't look very fast. Is it, oh, uh, yeah, is it slow? Uh, maximum speed 610 miles an hour, Six. so just short of Mach 1. Yeah, okay, and what kind of payload are we looking at here? 12,800 pounds. 
Okay, so similar to the Lancaster up there, which is probably about the same size as. So it's still a big old BS safe size. It's a big old bird still to land on a carrier, but okay. Um, uh, what else do we know about this? When did it finish service? Ninety-one was when it was retired. So these these old things have all have massive histories. Yeah, it was yeah. a carrier-based nuclear bomber. Carrier-based nuclear bomber, right? And um, but what would this have been bombing then? Uh, I guess Russia from a different angle. Yeah, anything you want on a carrier, you just yeah. take it somewhere and it'll bomb it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Range from the carrier was uh, two thousand one hundred miles. Two thousand. So that's pretty impressive. I know it's you never really know if that's fully loaded or not, but that's it's okay for a small plane. Hmm. Yeah, running the two engines under the wings are Pratt and Whitney J fifty sevens, so the same things from the Strata Fortress. From the Strata Fortress, which is there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the same. The the B fifty two has oh, eight. Sorry. This thing has two. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's it's pretty small. It's just it's okay actually. It's pretty fast really. So yeah, Mac zero point seven or whatever that equates to. It's pretty cool plane. A uh, gun at the back, is that right? Cannon at the back? Uh, yes, two 20mm cannons in a tail turret. Cool, pretty cool. Alright, anything to add to the Sky Warrior before we sign off? Right, I hope you enjoyed that. That's, God, it's taken two hours somehow to do only that long. Happened two hours? Yeah, but... <laughs> I think we spent I mean, a we, long time on the Vulcan. Yeah, we did go on a tangent yeah. when it came to the Vulcan. Well, Cap, I'm advising you there's going to be another chan tangent when it comes to the Nighthawk. Yes, these are interesting planes with big and full histories. They need uh, they need examining, and I'm sure people want to hear about it, so it's cool. All right, so that's movie one. Looks like we're going to have movie two, movie three, movie four over the coming weeks. I hope everyone enjoyed that. I certainly learned a lot, as ever. Other than that, thanks for watching, and we'll see you later.